This looks like a meeting of the PNC legal department because everybody sits on this side of the room and tries to figure out how to get out while I'm talking. <laughs> so uh, welcome everybody, I'm Greg Jordan and uh, we're really pleased at PNC to have PNC hosting you tonight and, and really honored that, that uh, Maida allowed us to do this uh, for such a, an important cause for uh, justice in Pennsylvania, which of course as lawyers is near and dear to all of our hearts. Uh, and of course, a wonderful event honoring a great, great friend and, and lawyer and mentor for all of us, uh, Paul Titus. So I can remember at last year's event, which was the first one, right? When we uh, honored or roasted Tom McGough. And, um, <laughs> and I can remember saying to Maida that the m mistake was she started with Tom and it's, sort of impossible to continue to find people that are worthy when you start with Tom. Uh, but I, I didn't really uh, canvas my memory and, and think about, we do have somebody like Paul Titus, uh, who is just like Tom, uh, an icon here in the local bar and the community and, and having done so much. Um, and, you know, my role is really just to welcome you and hand it to Maida. But first, I wanted to just give you one little Paul Titus story that's uh, in my life. Um, so my, about 30 years ago, I had my first Third Circuit argument. And I was an associate at Reed Smith, didn't know what I was doing at all. Uh, went to see Tom McGough, and he probably said, you know, you're hopeless, just go do the best you can. He sent me over to <laughs> Philadelphia. <laughs> but, but the uh, lawyer on the other side was Paul Titus, who then, uh, 30 years ago, like today, was one of the icons and, and leaders of the bar. Uh, because it was my first um, time arguing in the appellate court, of course, I talked about it with my parents, so my dad, who was a railroader, said, hey, that sounds cool, can I come and watch? I said, sure. So he came with me to Philadelphia. We actually drove, I think, because he didn't want to buy a plane ticket. We drove and he, he stayed in my hotel room with me and kind of listened as I was practicing my stuff. I remember we went to, out to dinner and then the next day we had the argument. And I introduced him to Paul in the lobby before we went in and made the argument. And I can remember being scared to death, and Judge Sloviter, who was terrifying for anybody, uh, was looking down, and, uh, and we had the argument. And I don't really remember how it went. I don't really remember much about the case, and I really don't remember what the ruling was. What I remember is we were the last argument before the break, right before lunch. And after the argument, the judges were kind of packing up their books, and uh, Paul uh, said, uh, may it please the court one last time if I could, I know we're leaving here, but um, I wanted to invite Greg Jordan's father to come down and meet you. This is, you probably couldn't tell, which was a lie. This was Greg's first argument. <laughs> uh, and, but I, his father came from Wheeling, West Virginia to watch him. And I, I think it'd be great if you could have a chance to meet him. So my dad went down and met the judges. And I've never forgotten that. And when I tell that story, uh, people think, you know, it can't be true that lawyers don't treat each other that way. But for Paul, I'm sure you all have your own stories like that. And I've never forgotten that. And I think that's how he lived his life every day and how he treated people. And um, it was a wonderful memory I'll never forget. My dad's still alive. I'll call him on the way home, and we'll have a good laugh about that uh, on the way home. So, Paul, personally, I'm really pleased that you're winning this award. And uh, I feel actually a lot better about tonight's event than a year ago. Uh, <laughs> but I'm going to leave it right there. Uh, and. Uh, and I'm going to turn it over to Maida, and thank you for all you're doing for this wonderful cause. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. 
Having the opportunity to speak to all of you this evening is truly an honor. Having the opportunity to speak to you from the tower at PNC Plaza, where we're very graciously hosted by Greg Jordan, is an honor as well. And having the opportunity to speak to you at a time that PMC is honoring Paul Titus is a privilege that I cherish. Ken Gormley has the formal honor of painting Paul's portrait for all of us shortly, so I'm going to confine my remarks to the work that PMC has been doing over the past year, work that I hope you find as meaningful and impactful as we do, and work that has Paul's fingerprints all over it. Well, we so often think of major discoveries and advances being accomplished by a single individual who has the genius to shift the paradigm or the bravery to march into the unknown alone. The less dramatic reality is that all great things require the work of many people striving in small and in mighty ways over time periods so much longer than we might like to acknowledge. And such is the work of PMC. In our 30 years, we have become very adept at forming and participating in coalitions to accomplish our aims, whether those efforts take decades or years or months. Some of those coalitions require working with those who don't necessarily share our view of things or who want to reach the same goal, but for very different reasons. Some coalitions are built for a common purpose, where the aim is to marshal and deploy resources for optimal effectiveness. Our work to change the judicial selection process in Pennsylvania falls into the first category, a 30 years war. Our work here in Pittsburgh on the eviction crisis, though, falls into the second, a labor of love. Coalition building is hard work, especially when you, what you want to accomplish doesn't have a natural constituency. It requires active listening, not that pale substitute of making eye contact while you're formulating your next comment, regardless of whether it's responsive to the person you're talking to or not, no one changes their mind or finds their way to a different perspective if they aren't heard. Coalition building requires respect for those who disagree with you, even if they seem stubborn or unwilling to hear your arguments. They might have a good point or expose a flaw in your thinking that your enthusiasm blinds you from seeing. And while the cognitive dissonance that that kind of experience creates. You know that knot in your stomach that you get when you realize someone else might have a good point and that might mean you have to revise something that you think or that you're doing. That dissonance is very hard to take, but it's an essential part of getting a job done well. Coalition building also requires doggedness, especially if the effort takes decades or more. You can ask PMC about that. You simply can't give up if you believe in what you want to accomplish, if you believe that it's right, or it's good, or at least it's helpful, and you need other people to agree with you in order to achieve it. As we've all heard more times than we would like to remember, this is a marathon dummy, not a sprint. And I tell myself that every morning when I wake up. Coalition building also takes kismet too, unfortunately just that right mix of circumstances to convince enough of your opposition or skeptics or fence sitters that it's worth throwing themselves into the fray with you to make a change. Their reasons might not be yours, but you can't afford to be that finicky. Keep your eye on the ball. There is a world of reasons to do the right thing. If we're to achieve the long-sought change to our state constitution to require the appointment of our appellate judges, we have to continue to keep together a coalition of people, organizations, 
and legislators who represent a diversity of political positions and goals. As of today, we are managing to do just that in this current legislative session. But I don't want to promise too much. I'd rather you be elated by an unexpected success than have your hopes dashed as they were last session when the rug was pulled out from under us. We have brilliant leadership this time around. Brian Cutler, our former prime sponsor, is now the majority leader of the House, and his passion is evident in our progress this session. He remains unapologetically optimistic about our efforts to get House Bill 111 through the House this time. He's being ably assisted by Paul Schimmel, a Republican from the middle of the state, whose experiences as a lawyer in Maryland, a merit selection state, and Pennsylvania have shaped his deeply held belief in our cause. We've created and made good use of opportunities to speak directly to legislators in small groups and one-on-one, -on -one. and we now believe that the bill will be considered by the Judiciary Committee of the House in late April or early May. The Democrats' support in the Judiciary Committee is less than we'd like to see. I have to be honest about that. Unfortunately, the trial lawyers, that is many in the plaintiff's trial bar, as well as uh, some labor support, haven't come into our coalition in the way that we might like them to, and their outsized ability to fund the campaigns of Pennsylvania legislators, especially some of our Democratic leadership that hails from Allegheny County, makes our efforts all the more difficult. Someone must reach them, perhaps one of you, and help them understand that having an appointment system doesn't sound the death knell of their agenda, only the ascendancy of merit over money. On the Senate side, Senator Greenleaf, who long held sway over the Judiciary Committee there, retired. He wasn't a supporter of merit selection appointment systems and wouldn't have encouraged the consideration of our bill. He has been replaced by Lisa Baker, who is a supporter of our efforts, and that's very good news for us. We also have strong leadership in Senator Langerholk and Senator Williams, who will shortly introduce our bill on the Senate side. And we have made really an unprecedented early push in that chamber that's bearing fruit. It's also clear that Majority Leader Cutler has generated a lot of energy around House Bill 111, and that's having an impact on his Senate colleagues. In fact, they're talking about it in the hallways. I overheard it just the other day when I was in Harrisburg. The results to date are truly the work of a coalition. So how do we manage to keep it together? Confidence in our vision and belief in the value of a Citizens Commission-led merit selection process allows us to listen attentively and wholeheartedly to what others have to say about them. PMC never enters a legislator's office with a raised voice or outrage. And representatives have commented on the calm with which we engage them. We have been and remain willing to listen truly to what others have to say on the subject. And that ready ear comes from a deep respect for others' ideas and needs and a willingness to compromise when compromise will lead to the level of support and commitment that good government legislation requires. While PMC's position on merit selection had always hinged on a statewide selection process. That is, if all the great judges are from Erie, then everybody on the Supreme Court should be from Erie. But the gnawing concern of people from the middle of Pennsylvania, 
that they wouldn't have equal footing with candidates from Allegheny County or from Philadelphia County, has convinced us that selecting jurists from three districts, nearly congruent with our federal district courts that we've long accepted, is a better way to encourage everyone to embrace this positive change. There has always been and remain cries that an appointive system eliminates citizens' right to vote for their judges. PMC has been particularly sensitive to this issue and respectful of those who voice it. We've worked hard to address it, too. There haven't always been elections for jurists. We take the current system for granted, but the history of the selection process is long and complex. What is abundantly clear to us, however, is that the system outlined in House Bill 111 retains the best elements of the elective system and the appointment system. The voters of Pennsylvania will be the ones to decide through a ballot referendum whether we move to a merit selection system. They have the ultimate vote. Voters will also continue to vote for magisterial district judges and judges of the common pleas courts. And when a judge is on a list of five candidates for an open position, nominated by the commission, selected by the governor, and approved by a two-thirds majority of the Senate, they will have to run for retention after only four years on the bench. And at that time, all of us will have the information we need to evaluate thoughtfully whether they have the ability to remain a part of our judiciary. And finally, we're the ones who elect the governor and the senators. And if we're not happy with the ways in which they play their roles in this process by selecting the commissioners, we have the votes to change that situation too. So clearly, voters are not being ignored. Doggedness. That term is synonymous with PMC. While some try to paint us as Don Quixote and me as Pollyanna, and we do share Don Quixote's longing for a better world, we're grounded pragmatists who've managed to remain committed to our goal despite the odds against us at other times in history. And for that, we should be applauded. I know we all hope that the stars have aligned, the huge impact that money, dark, gray, beige, whatever color you like, is having on judicial races can no longer be denied. It's beginning to fill the headlines. Take the recent decision by State Farm to settle a federal class action suit for $250 million, alleging that it manipulated a judicial race. It was alleged to have recruited, funded, and directed the campaign of a candidate it wanted on the Illinois Supreme Court, a candidate who won that election and then voted to overturn an earlier $1 billion verdict against the company. In Pennsylvania, in both 2015 and 2017, in the judicial elections, the outsized impact of campaign war chess was very, very clear. No matter how brilliant or experienced or ethical the candidate, and we have many brilliant ethical jurists in Pennsylvania, there will be a public perception of influence when money wins the day that cannot help but undermine our confidence in our court system. And we believe that confidence in our judicial system is essential to the future of our democracy. And so we continue to advocate until merit selection becomes a reality in Pennsylvania. There are other crises, however, that have to be addressed in a more immediate way. So I don't want you to think that PMC is a one-trick pony. We're not. There's an eviction crisis in Allegheny County, and fortunately, a highly motivated coalition of neighborhood organizations, nonprofits, individuals, and government entities, all brought under one tent by the proactive Pittsburgh Foundation 
to deal with this problem. And PMC is very lucky and grateful to be in this tent. According to the housing needs assessment that was commissioned by the city of Pittsburgh, the inflation-adjusted median rent in Pittsburgh has risen significantly, while the number of affordable housing units has declined, particularly for low-income populations. In Allegheny County alone, 23,000 households spent more than 50% of their income on rent and are extremely vulnerable to eviction and houselessness. The growing number of cost burden households, that is those paying 30% or more of their income towards housing costs, combined with the deteriorating conditions of many affordable housing units in Allegheny County, has raised actual housing costs, created needless conflicts between landlords and tenants, and resulted in increased eviction proceedings. In 2016 alone, the Allegheny County Judicial District docketed over 1,400 landlord-tenant disputes and over 300 ejectments. Because litigants in civil proceedings lack the right to counsel, many low-income tenants turn to legal aid societies for help. However, many who are eligible don't receive that help because they don't know they're entitled to it or the legal aid societies don't have the resources to help them. Jay Dwarren, the executive director of Pittsburgh's Fair Housing Partnership, has noted that many tenants face eviction as a result of lacking legal understanding of the eviction process, and thus PMC saw a place for our work here. We participated in focus groups and spent time talking with community organizers to figure out what the most useful role was that we could play in this crisis. We don't provide direct legal services. We don't have the money to make grants to individuals and organizations, but we do know the judicial system and how to advocate for people's rights. And with that feedback and the insights of our collaborators, we devised a new PMC Shares educational outreach effort tailored to the first judicial district. By providing these high-quality workshops, training, resources, we enable self-representation in eviction proceedings. And we're now considered a very vital tool in Allegheny County for those who lack the understanding of their legal rights and remedies. We also offer outreach efforts to landlords because it's just as important for them to understand the process as it is for tenants. And we've really strengthened relationships with our supportive local courts. We've made efforts to ensure that magisterial district judges are aware of this crisis, are meeting with community organizations, and so that people feel confident that when they're interacting with a magisterial district judge, that judge truly understands their needs as unrepresented tenants. <coughs> excuse me. We've collaborated with Philadelphia and Pennsylvania and, uh, excuse me, and Pittsburgh lawyers and judges to develop a handbook for landlords and tenants. And to date, we've hosted 20 Know Your Rights workshops for tenants and landlords in Allegheny County. Our handbooks are flying out the door of the magisterial district courts, and we're about to start our second printing. We're now also developing a partnership with the Carnegie Library System, as well as having wonderful relationships with the North Side Coalition for Fair Housing, the Hill District Consensus Group, Focus on Renewal, South Hills Interfaith Ministry, and Core of East Liberty. Our work in this coalition is very different from our advocacy work around merit selection, but nonetheless, the lessons are exactly the same. Hard work, active listening, respect, doggedness, and a dose of kismet wins the day. This is the formula that Paul Titus has brought to his life's work and to PMC low these many years. I would not be here tonight 
relating our accomplishments were it not for this very special human being and his commitment to us. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce Ken Gormley, president of Duquesne University and no stranger to all of you, to share his reflections on Paul and present him with the Judge Justin Johnson Award. Ken. Thank you so, Paul. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Maida. Uh, thanks to our hosts, Greg Jordan and PNC, not to be mistaken with PMC, for putting together, putting on this wonderful event tonight. And I want to make sure we congratulate our incredible 3L Duquesne Law student, Zane Podsabinski, for winning the law school writing competition. We're very proud of you. Where is Zane here? There he is back there, uh, and I, I just learned Zane, Zane has an offer from Babs Callen, so we, we don't have to pass out his resumes, but he also just got, uh, he got engaged to another Duquesne student, Lexi. Stand up, Lexi, come on. So that money is going to come in handy, folks. We appreciate it. Uh, it is a special privilege to introduce our honoree tonight, and I can tell you just from sitting next to him, Paul's a little nervous. I've known him for nearly 35 years since I started practicing law as a young whippersnapper in 1985 at a little firm called Mansman, Sindrich, and Titus. So I know what a great lawyer Paul Titus is, but I also know all the dirt. Julian Assange would have a field day with this guy. <laughs> Uh, fortunately for you, Paul, though, Bonnie found out that I was doing this intro. So she set up a clandestine, talked to the kids, set up a clandestine meeting in my office and pledged to name a building at Duquesne for three times what Lori Lachlan paid to get her daughter into college. Uh, so all I have to do is stick to this script, focus on the things that the Pennsylvanians for Modern Courts folks wants, want. And so once again, Paul, Bonnie has, Bonnie has saved your bacon like she has done since the day you were married. Uh, so with full credit going to Bonnie, I'd like to say some nice things about my friend and mentor, Paul Titus. But let me just say you're all invited to the dedication of Titus Hall on Duquesne campus next year. Or if that doesn't happen, you can come to my book launch on all the scandals that have surrounded Paul's background. Um, I do want to begin by saying a word about the person for whom this award is named, Judge Justin Johnson, another legal le legend. I know most of you know him. Uh, I've known him since the start of my career. And in fact, when I was a brand new law professor at Pitt Law School in the early 1900s, Professor Tom Garrity, some of you uh, may remember in the 1980s, uh, asked me to take over a case that he was handling for the ACLU, a First Amendment case. So it was the first case, my first case, Greg, it, it was funny to hear that story. My first appellate case, uh, one of the judges was Judge Justin Johnson. And I opened my argument like this, and this is true. I said, Your Honors, if you hear an unusual sound during this argument, don't worry, it's just my knees knocking under this table because this is my first argument. Don't hold it against my clients. And I remember Judge Johnson raised those great, big, wise eyebrows of his and said, young man, no need to worry about your knees knocking together. By the looks of your brief, you have bigger issues than that. <laughs> uh, but we ended up winning a couple of issues, which was far more than the plaintiff ever thought was happening. So he was my first judicial hero. Uh, and it's especially appropriate that this award for steadfast commitment to justice and excellence in the courts of Pennsylvania uh, should be named for that dedicated, brilliant, beloved Pennsylvania jurist. He really is a, a giant, an icon, as Greg said, in the profession. And he still remains a model for all of us. Uh, I saw him not too long ago. And so I want to uh, applaud Pennsylvanians for Modern Courts, Maida, for recognizing others who share Judge Johnson's deep commitment to equal access to justice, to promoting civic education and engagement and advancing excellence in our judicial system, which leads to our honoree tonight. So it's hard to know where to start with uh, talking about Paul Titus. Most of you know he's 
currently counsel at Schneider Harris here in Pittsburgh. His reputation is known in the whole city. Uh, handles every type of matter imaginable in both trial and appellate courts, shareholder disputes, contract disputes, antitrust litigation. He's also a world-class transactional lawyer. You don't have too many people who are doing some of everything, representing corporations, government entities, public and private institutions, you name it. Uh, an active member of uh, the ADR panel for the Western District of Pennsylvania, also part of the ADR practice group at Schneider, brings a calm perspective to complex issues and solves them. That's one of Paul, Paul's fortes. So how did it all begin? Paul grew up in Bradford, PA, in an historic location near the Zippo lighter plant, <laughs> uh, and attended St. Bonaventure's University after getting kicked out of St. Vincent's. Is that correct, Paul? Was it St. Vincent's where you were kicked out of? <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> Then got his law degree from Notre Dame in 1960, one of the best Catholic schools in the United States after Duquesne University, <laughs> and then clerked for Judge Luther M. Weigert, uh, Chief Judge of the U.S. District Court for Northern District of Indiana, and then wisely he thought better of becoming a Hoosier and decided to move to Pittsburgh with his lovely bride, Bonnie Postalway Titus of Punxsutawney, Pennsylvania. <laughs> And after settling in Pittsburgh, he believed that he had discovered his destiny, which was to do antitrust work for Copper's company. And so for over a decade, for a long time, Paul toiled in the vineyards of the antitrust field, literally became uh, uh, the best in the business, but never lo lost his heart for ordinary people. And that's how he ended up breaking every stereotype imaginable about corporate lawyers, because yes, he continued to do corporate work, does it to this day, but he also expanded his portfolio to cover all sorts of other practice areas, gaining admissions to the U.S. Supreme Court, federal courts all over the country, state courts, um, and if he saw a case that required attention to achieve justice, he took it, even if the client had limited or no ability to pay for the representation. I met Paul in, I think it was 1985, Paul, 1985, 1986. I was a new lawyer just cutting my teeth in practice. And Paul had just decided to leave his firm, name partner in a firm, to join with Bob Sindrich's firm to create Mansman Sindrich and Titus, uh, largely, I believe, to give himself more freedom to take the kinds of cases that he cared about. We handled at that firm, and those of you who remember that firm and then later Sindrich and Titus, we handled everything under the sun. It was exciting, it was unpredictable, crazy, funny, the best learning experience a young lawyer who cared about ethics and principle could ever hope to receive. Uh, I remember one young partner, I won't name him, Paul, you'll probably figure it out, uh, said to me one month uh, when, when he didn't think he was getting a big enough draw, he said that, complained that the firm was turning into a, a bunch of socialists. And I said, actually, it's not socialism. This is social good. Uh, this is the purest form of public service imaginable. And I quickly came to realize, truly, how special and rare that was, what was going on at the firm. We worked on, remember, a case dealing with cancer caused by a radioactive waste dump, by, with the Jeanette Glass bankruptcy and the human tragedy that flowed from that. Uh, we handled first-degree murder cases, some important gender discrimination cases for plaintiffs that established new precedent in the Third Circuit. Uh, I even got to handle a case involving, you know our favorite, Paul, fighting chickens, challenging the constitutionality of a Pennsylvania statute that made it a crime to merely own or possess these, these fighting chickens, even if they weren't being fought, and we managed to get that struck down. But Paul loved to, I'm sure you remember this, Paul, he would walk down the hall when he saw me and flap his wings and make <laughs> chicken noises whenever he saw me. Uh, when I decided I wanted to work on my first book, the biography of my old law professor, Archibald Cox, I asked Bob and Paul uh, if I could take off a few months without pay to move into an un, uncooled dorm in Harvard that summer to begin interviews for it. I didn't have a publisher, had no guarantee that this thing was ever going to even get published. 
Uh, Paul not only supported that plan, but I'll never forget it, that he and Bob uh, made sure that my health care was covered, that we got a little bit of uh, some living money too, so that my wife, Laura, and our brand new baby didn't starve because of uh, my impulsive project. And he also continued to encourage me, which was just a wonderful experience, to continue to teach state constitutional law at Pitt Law School as an adjunct professor, continue to write tragically boring law review articles, which I really enjoyed doing, uh, even though that meant less billable hours for the firm. And then when Chief Justice Ralph Cappy appointed Bob Sindrich to chair the Legislative Reapportionment Commission in Pennsylvania to sort out the, re the reapportionment mess in 1981, and Bob asked me to join him as executive director uh, and I always remember this, Paul. Paul bore down working longer days, longer nights, if that was even possible, so that Bob and I could spend time in Harrisburg and take on that important assignment that would hopefully allow our legislative system to work better, particularly at that time, uh, and still for minority citizens in our Commonwealth who weren't getting fair representation. Uh, when Paul's longtime friend Harris Wofford was elected to the U.S. Senate in Pennsylvania. Wofford immediately wanted to put Paul on the federal court, on the Court of Appeals. Paul declined. Uh, he was more interested in helping others get on the bench who he determined were highly qualified. And he told me, I'll never forget it, it was so striking to me that he told me that he could, felt he could do more practicing law instead of watching other people do it in front of a bench. Uh, that for me was really an amazing revelation, folks, as a young lawyer, to think that the practice of law could be an even more powerful vehicle for effectuating change than elected or appointed public office uh, if the right person was involved. And I remember sharing that lesson with my students as a young professor all the time. I'd say, you can work in any firm or government office, even a place that's smaller, doesn't seem to have the prestige or isn't as lucrative, and do big things with that uh, because you have to bring honor and prestige to that position. And I was thinking of Paul. Paul never stopped believing that. Uh, in the early 2000s, he worked uh, to exonerate a man wrongly convicted and condemned to death for the brutal murders of a young mother and two young daughters and a niece. He uncovered key medical evidence that had been overlooked in the first trial, and then after presenting that to the jury along with DNA evidence that placed the victim's estranged husband at the crime scene, the jury returned a unanimous verdict of not guilty for Paul's client. So thanks to his efforts, literally, that man was saved from death row. And in another case that I always thought was really impressive, in the city of Hazleton, they had enacted these ordinances to prevent people who didn't have legal immigration status from renting housing in the city. And the theory was, of course, that the, this influx of illegal uh, aliens, primarily Hispanics, some from, I think, uh, was it Dominican Republic uh, and, and other countries, would cause an increase of crime and a downturn in the economy. And after the trial court held the ordinances invalid, the city appealed. And so Paul filed an amicus brief along with 12 interfaith uh, organizations to the, support the plaintiffs and argued forcefully that every immigrant group in our country's history had been met with false charges that their immigration would increase crime, hurt the economy, and ultimately Paul's appeal to reason caused justice to prevail and the ordinances were struck down. Uh, along with that impressive pro bono work, Paul has been a longtime volunteer with Uptown Legal Clinic, providing uh, free legal services to low-income individuals on issues like disability benefits, employment uh, matters, things that really count for these folks. He's been active volunteering with the Sister Thea Bowman Catholic Academy in Wilkinsburg, and this school does great work with disadvantaged kids, and Paul has taught them constitutional law, 7th and 8th grade students, and also taken them on field trips to run mock trial program with them, taking them to D.C., Harrisburg to meet legislators. In 2016, 
He received the Allegheny County Bar Foundation's Lifetime uh, Pro Bono Service Award, one of the most significant of its kind, I would say, in the state. At Schneider, he uh, received the top pro bono award, and Dennis Supley, a former regent of the American College of, of uh, Trial Lawyers, said, in reality, the firm could give Paul the award every year for his continued pro bono efforts, but of course, Paul would reject all such recognition. And another Schneider colleague, Nancy Winkleman, uh, described Paul as one of the mu most beautiful people I've ever known, kind and gentle with a healthy dose of irreverence and humor. Walking through Pittsburgh with him is quite an experience. He keeps his pocket full of $5 bills and stops to give one to every homeless person he sees. Uh, that pretty much sums up this guy from Bradford. He gives everything he's got, his whole heart every day. He tries to do it without drawing attention to himself, which for all of us type AAA uh, attorneys should be a good lesson and a source of inspiration for all of us. Um, and I wasn't kidding when I said that Paul was prob probably dreading this speech because modesty and humility are an integral part of his essence. He believes that as a member of the legal profession, all of us have a duty to help those in need of access to justice without seeking any kind of a special credit for doing that work. And as you know, the other thing that has always been so important to him is making sure that our profession, the legal profession, remains a respected, honorable one. Uh, he served as the chair of the board of the American Judicature Society, poured a lot of time into that, active in the American College of Trial Lawyers, serving on its Access to Justice and Legal Services Committee, a founding member of Pennsylvania for Modern Courts, as you know, a stalwart advocate since the beginning of merit selection, uh, really since this organization began. He was a member of the House of Delegates of the American Bar Association, an officer of the Allegheny County Bar Association. He's a fellow in the American Bar Foundation, life fellow of the Pennsylvania Bar Foundation, and founding member of the American Inns of Court here in Pittsburgh. Uh, the awards and honors this man has received would fill up this uh, auditorium last winter, and I know a few of you were there, uh, Paul received, I was there and it was just such a special occasion on Martin Luther King Day to see Paul receive the prestigious Drum Major for Justice Award from the Homer S. Brown Law Division of the Allegheny County Bar Association at the Ebenezer Baptist Church in the Hill. Uh, he's been named Pittsburgh Lawyer of the Year for Appellate Practice by the Best Lawyers in America, won Alumni of the Year Award at St. Bonaventure University. He didn't get it at St. Vincent's, I can't figure out why, <laughs> and uh, served on St. Bonaventure's Board of Trustees for a decade in his spare time. Uh, when Paul isn't at the office or handling pro bono cases or out in the community volunteering, Bonnie, his amazing wife of 60 years who made possible this scandal-free speech, is always there pursuing the next adventure with them. Uh, they have three children, two grandchildren, and it's common to see them gathered around the table at their place in, in near Frick Park there overlooking the church. Uh, for dinner on Sunday. Paul also loves the outdoors. He loves fly fishing, although I'm not sure he's very good at it. Uh, and he looks forward to spending weekends at their cabin in the woods of Bradford, not far from the Zippo factory where he grew up. Not, he didn't grow up in the Zippo factory, but yeah. Um, if I had more time, I would tell you about Paul's many scary and dangerous journeys in the car from Bradford to Pittsburgh <laughs> in the snow, about his terrible driving skills, and most specifically about the time he hit a deer and put the antlers on the hood of his car as an ornament for the rest of the winter to keep the deer's brothers and cousins away from him. But Bonnie said, you cannot tell the deer story, so I'm not going to do it. Um, <laughs> But even though Paul does not seek out or particularly like recognition or accolades, it is important and it is fitting that he's receiving this award tonight because it goes to the heart of his life's work. Uh, I remember it was not long at all after Paul joined the firm uh, during my first year, I think, of practice in the 80s, year or two, and he pulled me aside and told me about the work of the then brand new organization, Pennsylvania for Modern Courts. And uh, 
shortly after that introduced me to Judge Phyllis Beck, who was one of the driving forces from Philadelphia and remained a, a great friend for all those years after that. He was always brimming with enthusiasm for the work of that organization and the, the mission that it had set for itself. And three decades later, that remains Paul's passion. Uh, I'll, I'll just wrap up by saying when I called Bob Sindrich, the other half of the Sindrich and Titus, with whom pa Paul has worked so closely for so many years, and I told him about the award, he was going to be out of town, really disappointed he couldn't be here to speak. I was really disappointed because he has some real dirt on Paul. Uh, but, and I'm, I'm not even going to tell you what Judge Tim Lewis has said about him hang, hanging out on the corner of Forbes, uh, Fifth and Liberty at 2 a.m. I'm not going to get into that. Uh, but in summarizing, when I talked to Bob about this event, and he summarized his 35-year professional relationship with Paul by saying, I've never met a kinder or more gentle person in my life, not anywhere. He has an incisive mind and a gentlemanly comportment but he can be tough as nails in representing clients, especially the underserved and downtrodden. And then he paused for a second and added, his gentility is unmatched, but as you know, he also loves to create havoc. Paul has a real devilish streak. As soon as he starts laughing that uncontrollable laugh of his, you know he's up to something mischievous. <laughs> Bonnie and kids, is that correct or not? Is that accurate? Um, he ended by saying, during our years together, Paul has become like a brother. His commitment to the rule of law and to a highly qualified judiciary is an inspirational thing to see. He's done so much, and frankly, he's done more than anyone will ever know because he's so private about his contributions. But that's what's so special about him. I don't think there could be a more deserving recipient of this award. And I second that sentiment. Paul is a true mentor for which I will never be able to thank him sufficiently. I would never, I can tell you, have been able to achieve any of the exciting things in my own career uh, with, uh, without his uh, mentorship and leadership, which I know is true of hundreds of other lawyers in Pittsburgh and around the state and country. And most of all, I would never have learned about the absolute importance of public service and using the legal profession to achieve good for others in the quiet, old-fashioned way without learning from Paul's example. Um, anyone who knows Paul knows that his family has really made all of this possible because they put up with his endless escapades. So I'd like to make sure I introduce them here quickly. Uh, son Bill is here and, and daughter-in-law Marcia. Do you want to stand up? Come on. Time to... Uh, daughter Ann, daughter Ann is there. S son John, who I've known since he was a little kid. Sisters Ann and Margaret, they get the uh, really big applause. They've known him since he was a kid. And then the person who deserves most of the credit, his wife Bonnie, who's made all this possible. Come on. Uh, Congratulations to the whole Titus family for making this special recognition possible. And so, ladies and gentlemen, it is now my great honor to introduce the recipient of the 2019 Justice, Judge Justin Johnson Award for his steadfast commitment to judicial excellence and justice initiatives in this region and across the state, Attorney Paul Titus. I'd thought about are uh, out the window. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm 
standing here thinking, should I turn this into a roast of <laughs> President Gormley and a few other present and former colleagues that I see here? But I won't. I'll resist the temptation. I'll resist the temptation. Uh, I thank you for the award. But I think most of all, what I thank you for is for supporting this cause, supporting Pennsylvanians for modern courts and its efforts. Because improving the courts and strengthening the system of justice is what we're all about here. And uh, that's what's important about this event. I had some longer remarks about Pennsylvanians for modern courts, but made has really covered an awful lot of the important things they've done and are doing. <clears throat> but I'll add a couple of little notes from recent history, going back to the 60s, I guess, that maybe put in context some of these issues about judicial selection. I remember it was in 1963 in the spring, I met with uh, former Governor Lawrence. At that time, he was in the White House working with President Kennedy, and he came back to Pittsburgh on the weekends. And I met in an office here in town with him, and as I walked in, he was reading an opinion written by Judge David Oldham, sustaining the constitutionality of the Pennsylvania Human Relations Ordinance. And he said to me, do you know Judge Oldham? I said, I don't know him, but I said, he has a wonderful reputation. And he waved his finger and he said, I always tell the ward chairman, we have to put up good people for judges or the party will be embarrassed. Now that's a change, I think, from what we're seeing these days. But you sort of fast forward from that 20 years to when Dick Thornburg was governor. A couple of things that I think of. Uh, the uh, Superior Court was expanded because they changed the rules on appeal and a lot of the direct appeals to the Supreme Court were no longer a direct appeal to the Supreme Court. And uh, the Superior Court clearly needed more staff and it was expanded. But two of the key appointments that Dick Zornberg made were Democrats, Phyllis Beck, and Justin Johnson, and both of whom had remarkable careers. And of course, <clears throat> Justin is one that we honor here with this award. And I had the good fortune to be friends of he and his brother Livingston, who were on the, was on the Common Pleas Court here. And in fact, in 1970, uh, my partners at the then firm, called Kaufman and Kaufman, and I met with Justin and Livy. We were going to join our practices, and we pretty hell had it worked out. And then that evening, Livy called me and said the Governor Schaap's office had called him, and he was going on the Court of Common Pleas, so he couldn't join me. I've kidded him ever since he would do anything rather than practice law with me, even be a judge. <laughs> but. But, uh, and of course, Justin then went to the school board to become a full-time solicitor with him, uh, joined the firm here, and then, of course, went on the Superior Court and was a remarkable judge. And clearly, an award should be named for him. Uh, but uh, the other thing that happened when Dick was governor was the legislature adopted legislation to require or do away with cross-filing. Uh, and you could only, for appellate judges, only run in a single party. Dick vetoed the legislation, but his veto was overridden. And that has been a serious problem ever since. We've had four justices of our Supreme Court leave by removal or having to quit under criminal investigations and made a mention that we've had money pouring in from interests on both sides, from business interests, from labor, from the plaintiff's bar, and it has hurt our system. 
not that we don't have some wonderful judges and justices, but the whole system is hurt. When you have, as in 2015, probably, according to the Brennan Institute, 16 million spent on that election. And most of it is attack ads. We see them again and again and again. And they're ugly. They're oftentimes highly distorted and false. And yet the whole court has heard from that. Even those who are elected have been tarnished by this. It is time that we move to merit selection. And that's one of the reasons I've been active in Pennsylvanians for modern courts. We need to reform the system. So uh, I thank you for the award, but most of all, I thank you for your support of Pennsylvanians for Modern Courts, for the improvement of our system. It is the system of justice that we need to all serve. Thank you. <clears throat>